now, in common, at least to some sort of critical distance from a conventional way of looking at things. Now, Aristophanes returns to the conventions of the city and embraces most of them, but he's still critical and takes a critical distance from them. And that step that he takes outside of the conventional viewpoint is made possible by an appeal to nature. So even he is a follower of the cloud. And that's really an important little dramatic detail here. And then later on, as it turns out, he's the leader of the clouds. Not just a follower, but a leader, because he's their spokesman. It's possible for people to criticize conventions of society within conventions by stepping back from one convention and using another one as basically as a lens for criticism. But you can't really take the whole into view that way, because you're always sort of inside it and depending on it. And if you're going to take the whole of the human world into your view, you have to find a perspective outside of it where you can see it. It's much easier to draw a map of a building if you can step back from it and see the whole contour of it than if you're wandering around inside trying to figure out how the whole thing fits together. So if you're going to have a kind of holistic understanding of the nature of the human thing, you're going to have to have a standpoint outside of the human world in a sense, see them from. If you're going to have an, an understanding of human convention, you're going to have to have a natural standpoint from which to see the world of convention and take it in as a whole picture. And nature provides that standpoint. And this is why people are constantly trying to get to what's natural. They want to know what's permanent and what's not. Because if you remain entirely within a, the, the realm of convention, it's very easy to mistake things that are merely conventional for things that are natural. And people do that all the time. If you travel around to different cultures, suddenly you realize things that seem entirely natural to you really aren't natural, in a sense. They're second nature, meaning that they're deeply embedded conventions. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the clouds, too, is that they take on the shapes of things, and they reveal the natures of people, the, the clouds are great judges of character. When it's discussed how the clouds, when they come into the, into the presence of a coward, they'll take on the shape of a deer. At the very bottom of page 29, Strepsiotis says, they're like spread out wool, not women by Zeus, not at all. They don't look like women, they just look like big balls of wool. These have noses, he says. Now, of course, Socrates is famous for his big Karl Malden-esque nose. And so the clouds have taken on the shape of Socrates' nose. Okay, this is another little bit of color. And so anyway, at the top of 130, then he goes through a list of how the clouds reveal people's inner nature by taking on their shapes. Now, this shows that the clouds have an insight into human nature. And later on, the clouds make it very clear that they have grave reservations about Strepsiades' fitness for undergoing the course of study that he wants to get into. Socrates doesn't, though. And this is a very important issue. Socrates has token secrecy measures. He has a token interview and so forth, a token initiation to get into the thinkery. But when you, when you really look at it carefully, it's, it's a miserable token because it doesn't work. Socrates has absolutely no sense that Strepsiades is not the right kind of person to initiate into the secrets of nature even though he has ample opportunity to determine this before he takes them into the thinkery. Socrates is just a terrible judge of character. But the clouds aren't. What the clouds represent is, in a sense, knowledge not just of, of nature in the non-human sense, but also knowledge of the dynamics of human nature as well. But Socrates is unaware of that. The clouds represent wisdom derived from nature, but it's possible to derive wisdom about human beings from a study of nature, too. But Socrates has it. Socrates is a natural philosopher who looks away from the human thing to huge things like the planetary bodies and to tiny things like gnats and fleas, but completely leaves out the realm of the middle, where we live. We're middle-sized things, right? Socrates has no interest in that. So Socrates' conception of nature is much narrower or than the conception of nature represented by the clouds. So, in a sense, the clouds are wiser than Socrates because they represent a, a, a wisdom 
according to nature that has a much more expansive notion of what nature is. And in fact, when you get right down to it, Socrates is just a fool in this play. I mean, he's, a, he's, he's the butt of, of humor because he behaves in a foolish way. And why does he behave foolishly? Because with all of his scientific knowledge, he has no knowledge of human nature, and therefore he does not act prudently. When it comes to his conduct, his conduct is extremely flawed because he doesn't understand human beings and how human events take place. The next sort of interchange is really interesting. Socrates goes on to explain how the clouds are the only goddesses and all the others are dribble. And what about Zeus? Strepsiades asks. And Socrates at the top of 131 says, What Zeus? Don't babble. Zeus doesn't even exist. And then Strepsiades says, Well, who makes it rain then? Because, of course, Zeus was the one who was supposed to make it rain. And Socrates says, well, the clouds make it rain. When have you ever seen rain without clouds? But if Zeus makes it rain, then you think he could make it rain any time, whether there are clouds or not. Strepsiades finds that rather convincing. And then who makes it thunder, he asks. And he says, well, the clouds make it thunder. When they roll around and crash into one another up in the heavens, they make noise. And Strepsiades finds that interesting. But then he says, well, who moves the clouds around? Isn't that Zeus? And he says, no, they're born along by necessity, he says. This is below uh, 375. When they are filled up with much water and are compelled to be born along by necessity, hanging down full of rain, then they heavily fall into each other, bursting and clapping. And who is it that compels them to be born along, he asks. Yeah. Isn't it Zeus? And he says, not in the least. It's ethereal vortex. It's the <laughs> vortex that causes things to happen. And this was Anaximander's view, for instance, that there was this great vortex that's the source of all motion. Empedocles had a similar view, that there's a vortex, it's the swirling force that sets the rest of the cosmos in motion. It's the beating heart that sends everything else uh, coursing around. Strepsiades thinks, Vortex? I hadn't noticed that Zeus doesn't exist, and that instead of him, Vortex is now king. The Greek word for Vortex is Dinos, and the form of the Greek of Zeus is Dios, and Dinos could be understood as the diminutive or the offspring of Dios. And so what, what's happened here is, is poor Strepsiades thinks that Dinos, meaning Vortex, is really the son of Zeus, and that Zeus has been ousted by his own son, and there's a new king of the gods. And of course, this is perfectly consistent with the mythology, because Zeus ousted his father, who ousted his father before him. So he's immediately taken this notion of a vortex, which is just a natural force, and personified it and turned it into another god. And this is the pattern of Strepsiades' thinking. He literally can't conceive of a non-theistic notion of nature. And then, of course, they, he wants to know about thunder, and he says, well, have you ever eaten some stew and gotten gas from it and it rumbles through your belly? And he says, yes, indeed, yes, indeed, that's happened to me many times. And he goes through this whole scatological routine. And, of course, this is very interesting because what Socrates is doing is he's trying to sort of sap the sublimity and majesty of heavenly forces by explaining them away on the analogy of the lowest of human things, right? Mm-hmm namely our, our gas and our farting and our tummies rumbling. And then, Strepsiades gets to the thing that really concerns him here. What about the thunderbolt? Because isn't it the case that Zeus smites perjurers with his thunderbolt? And that's what really concerns him, because, of course, he's going to lie, right? He's going to go and you know be sworn in, and the equivalent of putting his hand on the Bible by swearing an oath to Zeus, and then he's going to lie when he has to go to court. And so he wants to know if Zeus is going to punish him. And what Socrates says is, well, no. The thunderbolt is caused by purely natural phenomena. The dry wind that gets clogged up in the clouds, and, and then the clouds are sort of swollen up, and then they, they burst, and the wind rushes out of the clouds very quickly and is ignited by the, by the swiftness of the force, and so you get this thunderbolt. And, of course, it's very clear that the thunder falls on the guilty and the innocent alike. My gosh, Zeus sent lightning down to smite one of his own temples. 
Lightning hits oak trees. Oak trees don't perjure themselves. They did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. So clearly there's no providence here. It's just natural, random phenomena. And Strepsiades is enormously relieved by this. Because now the last scruple has been hung, so to speak. I mean, he, he doesn't have to worry about Zeus, and so he feels that he can now go forward with his plan to cheat his way out of his death. And then the clouds addressed Strepsiades, and they said, okay, old man, you're going to have to give up everything. Food and sleep and friends and so forth, and wine and gymnastics and fun and study. They're not sure that he's capable of it, and they're, they're right to be uh, concerned with this. And at the bottom of 133, or near the bottom, Socrates says, Now won't you believe in no God but ours, this chaos, meaning the vortex, and the clouds, and the tongue. This is their trinity. The chaos, the clouds, and the tongue, meaning the art of, of speaking. And then Strepsiades in, you know, I always see these things, or hear these things, it's sort of like Gilbert and Sullivan patter song. Go through a long list of things that he promises to do, page 123, and what he wants to become. And finally, he goes into the thinkery, but there are a few prophecies that the clouds give out. And this is very important. The clouds prophesy about the future of human behavior. And again, that shows an understanding of human nature and also the way society works. They know that what goes around comes around. They understand how these things work. Socrates doesn't. And so, for instance, they give Delphic oracles at the top of 134, where it says 435, Strepsiades says, I don't want anything great. I just want to get out of my death. And the chorus says, then you'll get what you yearn for since you have no desire for great things. So that could mean that he'll get small things, but it could also mean bad things. It's one of these purposely ambiguous statements that oracles will utter. And then a little later on page 135 near the bottom, the clouds say, I think you're going to be, you're going to need blows. You're going to be, need a little bit of beating to get this into your head. And, of course, that foreshadows what happens to him later at the hands of his son. And then, finally, there's this last little bit of slapstick as he goes into the thinkery and he acts like he's going down into the underworld. And so he takes off his coat cloak because it, you, you enter the underworld stripped, right? And he says, put a honey cake in my hand, and I go down into the cave. It's a catabasis. It's a descent into the underworld which is a, an image that you get in the, uh, the beginning of Plato's Republic. Catabasis literally means it's going down, but, but in the context of the Greek, it, it refers to stories of descents into the underworld. And so the thinkery is a kind of underworld, which brings to mind how it's described at the very beginning. It's a thinkery of wise souls. It could also be shaved, like the, the souls of the dead. And so he goes into the thinkery, and then the first choral interlude takes place. Socrates is, uh, wants to perform this, and it, it just comes down to quibbling and hair-splitting about words. And poor Strepsiotis says, I, why, why are we learning things that I already know? And on the top of 144, below where it says 690 in the margin, he says, why am I learning things that we all know? And Socrates says, for nothing, by Zeus. <laughs> okay, and again, this is the, the theorist contempt for practical concerns. We're learning this for nothing. That's what's so good about it. This is how he understands this. And finally, he forces him to go and, and crawl under his blanket and come up with a thought, or he's going to be booted out of the thinkery. And so the first thing that he comes up with about how to get out of his lawsuit is, is at the bottom of 146. And he says, I have an idea. He says, I'll, I'll hire a witch to, to charm the moon out of the sky by co capturing its reflection in a mirror, and then I'll put okay. it in a little feathered box. And then the month won't change, the lunar month won't change, and so I won't owe the interest on my loan. <laughs> now, Socrates thinks, well, that's pretty good, you know. It's not great, but it's, it's an attempt. But the next thing that Strepsiades comes up with is really quite good. And he says, well, what about when they're going to write out an indictment of me? If I were to take the a lens, a glass lens, and stand a little ways off and reflect the sun and burn the indictment off the book, and he says, now that's a great idea. And of course, that is, that's applied science, right? Mm -hmm. It's science applied to, to mischief. And again, there's this connection that's being shown between the sophists and the natural philosophers, between the collapse of morality in the human realm and the investigation of nature scientifically. And the thing that, that connects them is the death of Zeus. 
It's only when Socrates shows that you don't need the gods to explain nature that Strepsiades feels completely comfortable in behaving badly. Science causes morality to collapse by undermining religious sanctions for former moral behavior. And that's the message here. And then the, the third thing Strepsiades comes up with, however, is, is quite shocking, and it leads to him being evicted, to being plunked out of the thinkery. He says, what if you get indicted? What, what do you do next? And he says, well, I'll run away and hang myself. That way they can bring me to trial. That's a little bit extreme. Of course it would work, but it's kind of foolish. But Socrates finds that so intolerable that he boots him out of the thinkery. Now, after all the stupidity he's endured with, with Strepsiades, you think that this wouldn't be any worse. But for some reason, the idea of not preserving one's life seems especially offensive to Socrates. And that's very interesting. Socrates seems to put a premium on self-preservation. But that's very different from the Socrates you get in, in, in Plato, who doesn't put a premium on self-preservation but on doing the right thing. But the idea of, of, of giving up one's life for anything seems to be entirely irrational for Socrates here. And that means that there are no things he values more than his own skin when you get right down to it. The clouds advise Strepsiades that the only way out of his ruin now is to send his son to the thinkery. And so Pheidippides is finally forced to go into the thinkery. But before he goes into the thinkery, Socrates says, I'm not going to tell him myself which of the speeches is the best, the just speech or the unjust. So let the speeches teach them. And then what happens is this wonderful debate where, where the just and the unjust speech come out of the thinkery personified, and they have this debate. And this is truly magnificent. So let's, let's look at the, uh, the contest between the just and the unjust speech, uh, starting on page 154. The just speech says at the center of 154, I will speak then of the ancient education as it was established when I was flourishing, speaking the just things and when moderation was believed in. First it was needful that no one hear a boy muttered, uh, muttering a sound. Next that those from the same neighborhood walk on the streets here in good order. To the sither of teachers lightly clad in a group, even if the snow came down like barley meal. Next again, he used to teach them to sing a song by heart, standing with their thighs apart. Palace, terrible sacker of cities, or a far-reaching shout, pitched the harmony that their fathers handed down. If anyone was ribald or added any modulation of the sort they use nowadays, he would be thrashed and beaten with many blows as one who would have faced them uses. So children are to be seen and not heard. They're to learn patriotic songs. They're to march around in little formations, lightly clad, so they won't get soft and effeminate. And uh, if they try and change the songs headed down from the past, they'll be thrashed for effacing the muses. This is the old-fashioned education. And it's supposed to produce moderation uh, and, and the other virtues the Greeks prize. Moderation, courage, piety, and so forth. It was needful for the boys to keep their thighs covered while sitting at the gymnastic trainers so as to show nothing cruel to those outside. Next again, when they stood up, they had to smooth the sand back again and be mindful not to leave behind an image of puberty for their lovers. Now we start getting a, a, an insight into one of the fascinations of the just speech. The just speech has a strange fascination with the genitalia of boys. He's fascinated with this, this institution of pederasty that the ancient Greeks uh, practiced. Yeah, he's a little more fascinated by it than might seem appropriate. At that time, no boy would anoint himself below the navel so that dew and down bloomed on their private parts as on fruit. Nor would he make up a soft voice and go to his lover, he himself pandering himself with his eyes. Nor was it allowed to him at dinner to help himself to the radishes, nor to snatch dill or parsley from his elders, nor to eat relishes, nor to giggle, nor to cross his legs. And then the unjust speech basically says, yes, you know, they, this reeks of leave it to beaver. And this is one of the themes that they have uh, running through the play. The unjust speech always treats anything that's old as old-fashioned and, and silly. And there's a sense of progress that the unjust speech has, that things are getting better and better whereas the just speech has a sense that things are getting worse to the extent that we depart from the old ways. 
So there's a sense of, he makes fun of things that are old-fashioned throughout this. And the just piece says, yes, but these are the things from which my education nurtured the men who fought at Marathon, equivalent to the World War II generation today, right? You know, they went out and beat them, beat the Persians. We might have been square, but we were very tough back then. That's, that's the claim. But you teach them how to bundle themselves up in their cloaks right away, so that I'm ready to choke whenever someone at the Panathenia who ought to be dancing holds his shield in front of his haunch, having no care for Trito Genia. Now, let's just leave this aside, but the point is, the, the point is, is that today the youth are soft. They're bundled up in their cloaks so they won't catch their sniffles. They don't know the, the proper warrior dances and things like this. And so he says, finally, to Pheidippides, the just speech, in view of these things, lad, be bold and choose me the stronger speech. And you'll have knowledge of how to hate the marketplace and keep away from the bath, and to be ashamed at shameful things and to be inflamed if anyone mocks you. There's a sense of honor that's part of the old-fashioned education. And to stand up from your seat for your elders when they approach, you know, old-fashioned respect. And not to misbehave towards your own parents, and not to do anything shameful that would tarnish the statue of awe. And not to dart into a dancing girl's house, lest you be broken off from your good fame by being hit with a fleet by a whore, while gaping at the things there. And not to talk back to your father at all, and not maliciously to remind him by calling him Iapetus of the age when he nourished you as a nestling. Don't make your old, don't make the old man feel like an old man. You know, you respect him. Of course, the unjust speech says, "Well, you, you'll be, you'll be just a goody two shoes. People will think you're just a baby." And then he promises, and finally, you know, this. And it's, it, it's a beautiful passage in some ways, as well as kind of funny. The just speech says, "Yes, but you'll pass your time in the gymnasium, sleek and flourishing, not mouthing prickly perversities in the marketplace as they do nowadays." And you won't be dragged into court over a greedy, contradicting, shystering, petty affair. Rather, you'll go down to the academy and run under the sacred olive trees with a moderate youth of your own age. You'll be crowned with a wreath of white, of white reeds, smelling of you and of leisure and of the white poplar shedding its leaves. And in the season of spring, you'll delight whenever the plane tree whispers to the elm. If you do these things that I tell you and pay mind to them, you will ha- always have a sleek chest, bright complexion, large shoulders, slender tongue, large buttocks, small penis. And this, this brings us to a very strange notion. The, 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 the Greeks, if you look at Greek statues, it's very odd. You find these statues of, of mature men with just child's genitalia, tiny little penises. And you wonder, why is this? And that was sort of to their taste. They thought that this was this was more attractive, and they also thought that large buttocks were attractive. So large buttocks and a small penis were considered attractive on men. Things do change. If you pursue what we do nowadays, first you will have a pale complexion, small shoulders, narrow chest, big tongue, small buttocks, big haunch, long decree. Okay, and uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, and, and then he says, but if you listen to the just, unjust speech, you'll end up bad pederasty that he's been talking about. But as a parent, he, he condemns pederasty, but as a parent, he's fascinated with it at the same time. And then the unjust speech takes his turn. Oh, and another thing I should mention, actually, that I skipped over, is that when the, first, when the two speeches first come out, the just speech begins by in, insulting the audience, calls them mindless and corrupt. Whereas the unjust speech flatters them and says, no, they're wise. And then the, the, and you see this sort of pattern with the unjust speech here too. The unjust speech is a flatterer. That's the first thing you notice about him. But let's look at what he says uh, next. The top of 158. I'll just read his refutation of the just speech. He says first that he won't let you wash in warm water because that makes people soft, right? The just speech says, in our days, men took cold baths. And and yet, who was the toughest of them all? Wasn't it Heracles? Well, the Greeks called hot baths or hot springs the baths of Heracles. You've never seen a cold bath of Heracles, have you? No. Well, there you are, then. If Heracles is the toughest of all and he took warm baths, then, then who are you to to say that cold baths are necessary to uh, build good character. Okay, that's the first 
refutation. It's very important also that the unjust speech asserts that he wants the just speech to go ahead first. He, he can't make a speech on his own. He has to wait till the, the just speech speaks, and then he picks holes in what the just speech says. Okay, he's parasitic on what the just speech says. The next uh, argument is this. He says that you shouldn't hang around the marketplace. That's a bad thing to do. But if you look at Homer, didn't Nestor, the wisest of the uh, the Greeks, uh, wasn't he an orator, a man of the public, uh, the marketplace? Yes, well, there you go then. And then the next argument is this. It's against the idea of being moderate. It's at the bottom of 158, just where it says 1060 in the margin. Again, he also says that they should be moderate. These are the two, these are two of the greatest evils. For, for whom have you ever seen anything good happen to because of being moderate? Speak up and refute me by telling whom. Who's ever been well served by moderation? And he says, there are many. Peleus, at any rate, got his sword because of this. A sword? A pretty gain the miserably unhappy man got. Hyperbolus of the lamp market got many talents, meaning talents were a certain weight of silver or gold, because of villainy, but no by Zeus, no sword. So he's saying, well, moderate men don't flourish. They finish last. Nice guys finish last. Villains get ahead. Moderation, therefore, isn't a, isn't a virtue. And he then refers to other other myths. He goes on with this myth of Peleus and Thetis, and said, well, you know, Thetis abandoned Peleus because he wasn't, as he, as he put it, Yet she went off and abandoned him, for he wasn't hubristic or pleasant to spend all night with in the bedclothes. A woman delights in being treated wantonly, but you are a big Kronos. And Kronos, of course, refers to the ancient times. You're, you're an old fogey, is what he's saying. And so he's saying that moderation isn't a virtue because you don't have any fun. If you're moderate, in fact, you finish last. And then he goes on and talks about the other things you're denied through moderation. Consider, lad, all that moderation involves and how many pleasures you're going to be deprived of. And here's one of the hooks, pleasure. The, the sophists were, again, hedonists, and their great appeal was to try and make their way of life seem the most pleasurable. You'll be deprived of boys, women, cottabus, which was a drinking game, relishes, drinking, boisterous laughter. Yet what is living worth if you're deprived of all these things? Well, then, from here I go on to the necessities of nature. Again, we have this notion of necessity. What if, through the necessities of nature, have sex with a married woman and you're caught? What do you say to the husband? Well, if you listen to me, you'll say, well, didn't Zeus get vested in love? Who are you to be any better than Zeus? Okay. He appeals to the, to the model of the gods. And the gods are doing all kinds of bad things. And then the last thing deals with the issue of buggery. For the ancient Greeks, passive anal homosexual intercourse was considered to be dishonorable. Yet, of course, it happened all the time. And so, on the one hand, they, it, was, it was strictly a bad thing, but on the other hand, it was a very common bad thing that people did. And so, what the just speech is condemned buggery, and the, the just, unjust speech responded response says, well, where do all the politicians come from? The buggered. What about all the, tra the tragedians? Well, they were buggered too. What about the public advocates? You know, though they were buggered. And, and then he says, what about the audience here? And then you can imagine him looking out in the audience and saying, well, he was, and he was, and he was, and of course everyone's laughing. And uh, they're all buggered. And he finally says, you debauchees, and then he takes off his cloak and, de and, and deserts to the other side. The just speech deserts the field. He's been vested. Now, this is an extraordinary little exchange. But if you look at it carefully, you see that there are all kinds of things that, that Aristophanes is pointing to that constitute the weaknesses of the just speech. Aristophanes is basically on the side of the just speech. Yet at the same time, he recognizes that the just speech has weaknesses. And, and it's the weaknesses of the just speech that he would like to point out that are the very causes for it losing. And I can think of five things, basically. Okay. First of all, it's that the just speech doesn't know the art of rhetoric, the art of persuasion. 
And the fact of the matter is, is that persuasion is just an art, and that means it's morally neutral. You can persuade people of good things as well as bad things. And so it's sort of silly to allow all the scoundrels to practice rhetoric and not learn rhetoric yourself if you want to fight them. The just speech doesn't know rhetoric because he begins by insulting his audience, whereas the unjust speech begins by flattering them, which is a clear sign of superior rhetorical skill. Now, another thing is this. The just speech doesn't know how to defend what you can call natural inequality and natural authority. And where this comes out is, is very clearly in in relationship to the, the gods, the appeal to the gods. Heracles takes warm baths, so why can't I, or why can't we, is the question. Well, one could answer that by simply saying, well, Heracles was the offspring of a god, and you're not. So maybe Heracles doesn't need to take as many cares to make himself tough as a mere mortal does. We're not on equal grounds with Heracles. He's better than us. There's a natural inequality that exists there, and therefore we can expect to act in the same way. And the same point goes when he appeals to the, the example of Zeus. Yes, Zeus has been cheated on and also cheated on many people. But Zeus is a god, and we're not. Hera is the goddess of the family, yet she also cheats on her husband, just as the husband cheats on her. Zeus is the patron of the patriarchal family, yet he's also an adulterer, which undermines the family. So why shouldn't we all be adulterers too? Well, because Zeus is a god and we're not. You see, the, the unjust speech basically says we should do as the gods do, not as the gods say. The gods don't practice marital fidelity, but they tell us that we should. And since we're on, not on equal terms with them, it's possible for them to say for us to do one thing, but yet not practice it themselves. And it's only in a case where you're on equal terms with somebody that it's, it's right to object to their hypocrisy, in a sense. When you're a kid and, and your parents say, I want you to go to bed at 9 o'clock, and you say, but you don't go to bed at 9 o'clock, the proper response is, I'm older than you, and I know it's in your interest, and that's that. So you go to bed at 9 o'clock. It's not equal between us. There's a natural authority that parents have over children, or gods have over mortals, and a natural inequality that exists there. And the authority is based on the inequality in some sense. Parents are wiser than children, and gods are wiser than mortals. But the just speech doesn't have any way of defending that. And so, as soon as these inequalities are pointed out, he just sort of gives up the ghost. He gives up the argument. And that's, and that's a deep flaw. So part of what, put it this way, part of what Aristophanes is pointing towards is the recognition of inequality as a necessary lesson to learn from nature. We have to recognize that nature doesn't cut us equally. And because of inequalities, specifically the inequalities of wisdom, but also inequalities of age, there are inequalities of treatment or proper behavior. You can never treat your parents as equals. They never, they can never, and they can never see you really as equals. I mean, that's just sort of the way things are. Even if you're what much wiser than they are, or smarter, or better educated, they always see you as a kid. There's an inequality there that can't be erased. A third point is related to the second, which is that the just speech appeals to myth and to the poets to back up his education. Yet, the Greek myths were extremely bad sources of moral examples. Now, of course, you could say, well, you're supposed to do as the gods say, but not as they do. But still, the better thing would be to have better myths, better gods. You know, gods that you could actually look up to, which the Greeks simply couldn't do. And so the attempt to found morality on the Greek gods is a very, very foolish undertaking in Aristophanes' view. And there's a fifth point that I think is very important, and, and that really comes in at the end with, with this whole issue of buggery. Because on the one hand, the just speech wants to maintain certain ideals of sexual morality that certain things are 
dishonorable or shameful. Yet as soon as he's confronted with the fact that people aren't up to maintaining that standard, his reaction is simply to abandon the standard. But that's a weakness in his position. And the weakness comes from this fact, that he's not willing in some way to tolerate human hypocrisy or human moral failure. Yet, if you maintain high moral standards, it's inevitable that people are going to fail to meet them, given human nature. So, therefore, one of the costs of maintaining high moral standards is having to be somewhat tolerant of the human propensity to fail to meet them. Because if you have very high ideals, and you can't recognize the necessity that you're, that people are going to fail to meet them, the tendency is to be just, to just abandon the ideals. Put it this way. The, the just speech has no tolerance for the fact that human, there's a gap between human real behavior and ideal human behavior. And therefore, since he can't bring real behavior up to the ideal, he lowers the ideal or abandons the ideal and just gives in to what's real. And so he, he, in a sense, lowers his standards because he can't abide any difference between what's ideal and what's real. So he just lowers, abandons his ideals. He abandons his standards. It's these five characteristics, I think, of the just speech that Aristophanes thinks cause it to fail. And these are the precise things I think that Aristophanes would want to amend about the traditional Greek understanding of things. He wants to bring in an understanding of rhetoric. He wants to bring in a recognition that there are certain natural inequalities that lead to in unequal forms of treatment. And that you can defend, put it this way, you can defend conventional inequalities on the basis of natural inequalities. You should cease to appeal to myth to give reason for being moral. But there are natural reasons for being moral, as Strepsiades discovers in this play. We need to have some sort of tolerance for the gap between ideals of human behavior and in human reality, because if we don't, we're going to either spend our time, our time futilely berating people to become better than they really can be, or we'll just simply abandon all moral ideals and just give in to whatever bad behavior people are in, 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 habituated to. Now, there's one fifth item, too, and that's this. There is no real room for pleasure in the just speeches worldview. And this is one of its weaknesses. The just speech never tries to show that old-fashioned virtue has its pleasures too. Right? He's just saying, you know, if you don't do this, you'll be thrashed. Well, fine, but is there anything in it for me if I do do it besides just avoiding a thrashing? And that's an important thing to, 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 to talk about. And Aristotle in his ethics, for instance, is very, very good about trying to show that noble behavior has its more refined pleasures, too, as a way of, of refuting the claims that the only pleasurable life is the life of, of sort of immoral, hedonistic self-gratification. Yet that's not part of the just speech, and therefore it's a major weakness of the just speech. Now let me just sort of sprint to the end of the play. Strepsiades' uh, son, Pheidippides, comes out of the thinkery, and the father gives him a graduation feast. And there's an argument about poetry, and specifically it's an argument about Euripides. The son wants to sing a bit of Euripides on incest, and the father thinks that's shocking. And words are exchanged, and then blows are exchanged, and poor Strepsiades is beaten up by his son. He rushes outdoors and asks for his neighbors to bear witness to this effect, not even thinking that he has undermined his neighbors' willingness to stand on his side by his willingness to cheat them. He's starting to realize that what goes around comes around. And then the son it goes through the shameless display of arguing that, that it's right to beat one's father. And it, it's very interesting because what he does is he says, well, you know, isn't it right for the wise to beat the foolish? Yes. Well, I'm wiser than you are, so I need to beat you for your own good. The only inequality that Pheidippides can recognize is the inequality of wisdom. He doesn't recognize that there's an inequality that's built into the, the relationship of parents to children that has nothing to do with wisdom. 
even if your parents are foolish old people, uh, or grandparents are foolish old people, you owe them something that you can't really pay off. There's a kind of filial debt that really can't be repaid in any, in any kind, and therefore you just sort of owe them a kind of respect. Well, that's completely evaporated from forced identities. He has no respect for his father whatsoever. He only has respect for wisdom. And as it turns out, he does regard Socrates as having a certain authority. And there's an exchange where Pheidippides is, is trying to show that it's perfectly natural to beat one's parents. And he says that, that chickens resist their parents if they attack them. And Strepsiades says, well, why don't you eat your dung and sit on a perch, too, if you want to act like a chicken? And the response that Pheidippides has is, is a very weak response. He just dogmatically asserts that it's not the same, and Socrates wouldn't think so either. And that indicates that Pheidippides really hasn't gotten the full speech, and so he just retreats to this dogmatic claim and then appeals to the authority of Socrates. It's also very apparent, too, that he doesn't understand natural philosophy any better than his father does. Because when his father swears by Zeus, he says, don't you know that Zeus is dead and Vortex is king? Which is the same <laughs> stupid error that his father makes. But anyway, the, the issue of incest is really fascinating because it's the thing that finally snaps poor Strepsiades out of his willingness to put up with his son's bad behavior. And the incest taboo is a fascinating thing that people have reflected on for thousands of years. Is it natural or is it conventional? It's, it's one of these deep-seated sorts of revulsions that exist in virtually every society in one form or another. And it's the prospect of mother-beating that sends, of course, Strepsiades over the edge. And in connection with the, with the reference to the Euripides poem, there's a certain hint that this might involve something more than beating, but it's a kind of incestuous relationship that maybe is, uh, is being implied here. And that really sends the father over the edge. And then at this point he realizes that by undermining Zeus, who pr protects the law courts, he's also undermined Zeus, who protects the family. And then he needs Zeus in order to maintain his family life. In, in effect, he decides, well, I'm going to have I'm going to have to re-embrace Zeus again. And then he goes and he burns down the thinkery. And, and that's the end. Now, what I'd like to do next time is we're going to find that there are all kinds of allusions to the clouds throughout Plato's dialogues. And so the larger meaning of, of the clouds is going to become clearer and clearer as we read Plato. And the first thing I want to read for next time is this dialogue called Theages. And Theages is very interesting because in it a rustic gentleman brings his son to Socrates to be educated. And the son is kind of a conceited kid. And Socrates, after interviewing him for a while, decides that he's not going to take the kid on as a student. And what he appeals to is his little daimonion, his little voice, says no. Now, Socrates in the clouds has no little daimonion. The only daimonia that are referred to in the clouds are the clouds themselves. But the clouds represent a knowledge of human nature and human affairs, a wisdom that's based on that kind of understanding. And Socrates in the Theages has that kind of ability to understand human nature and to regulate his actions prudently. And the change in the character of Socrates is correlated with the presence of this thing he calls his daimonion, his little voice. And what it represents, in my view, is the assimilation by Socrates of the, of the lessons of the clouds. I think that what the clouds taught Socrates is the necessity of turning away from this abstract theoretical attempt to understand nature back towards understanding the human things. And the reason is simple. Socrates was searching for wisdom by looking to nature, but he ended up acting like a prize fool because he was searching for wisdom in the wrong kind of nature. He was searching for wisdom in non-human nature in very large and very small things, and ignoring the human world. And, it's, and it's, that it's only by looking at human nature that you're ever going to come up with a, an understanding of what's right by nature that will allow one to become a good judge of character and to regulate one's actions prudently rather than foolishly. So what I see in the clouds is, in a sense, the first piece of what you would call Socratic philosophy. It's not Socratic, it's Aristophanian philosophy. 
the turn away from nature towards human things, and the turn away from theory-centered philosophy to moral-centered philosophy, or practice-centered philosophy, is in the clouds. And this gave a a very powerful impetus to Socrates to turn from being a pre-Socratic philosopher to a Socratic philosopher, or what I would say an Aristophanian philosopher. It's a turn towards what you can call a humanistic rather than a scientific approach to philosophizing. And and so we're going to see this borne out in the Plato. Socrates attacks Aristophanes in the Apology. But what's most extraordinary about the Platonic Dialogues is the the very silent tributes to Aristophanes you find everywhere. Aristophanes was really the great teacher of both Socrates and Plato and really the first philosopher of this type in, in Western history.